everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. But even better, you've joined us on Fundraisers Friday with Tony Bell. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of American Nonprofit Academy. Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy, one of the great thought leaders in our sector. Hey, welcome, Tony. Thank you so much, Julia. Happy Friday. Hard to believe it's, I don't know about you, but this week went by fast. Time just got way too fast. So got to celebrate every moment. And I definitely celebrate this time together with you every Friday. So thank you again for having me. Oh, my gosh. Well, I love your energy. I always love what you have to say. Um, and today it's going to be somewhat of a controversial show because we're going to be talking about incentivizing fundraisers and their work. And this is one of those things that is so, I feel like, People have an opinion and that's it. And they're not, they're very intransigent, right? And so I want to explore this a little bit more with you to see what you're thinking, um, because obviously it's not working when we're bleeding off fund development folks and, and, and trained professionals. Um, we talked about this last week. I think you brought up the average tenure is running 16 to 19 months of a professional mm -hmm. fundraiser. Not mm -hmm. acceptable. I mean, that that's so negative. Um, so this is going to be a really interesting conversation. And I'm really thrilled you're here with me to have this. Along with our presenting sponsors, they are really the backbone of what we do each and every day. Now more than 1100 episodes of the nonprofit show. I know wow is right, Tony, it even amazes me. <laughs> but but our sponsors include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. We have this amazing co-host co cohort, say that fast three times. And again, <laughs> um, I'm Julia Patrick, joined today by the amazing Tony Bell. Okay, this is a big topic because for me, coming from so many years of the for-profit world, um, specifically with publishing and ad sales, we lived off of a commission structure. And right. that is verboten, not to be spoken. You summon the demons of hell if you say that in the nonprofit <laughs> sector. So let's talk about this. And, and, Tell me why you think we need to have defined measurements in order to even become successful. Yeah, thank, thanks, Julia. When you and I first kind of talked about this topic and what it might look like to kind of bring it to the nonprofit show audience, before we can really talk about what do incentives look like for fundraisers, I mean, really for anyone, you know, that's part of our team, we have to kind of take a few steps back and make sure we have other things in place other policies and processes in place before we can talk about incentives, which to me, incentives are like the icing on the cake, right? There's all these other things and then incentives are like the icing on the cake. So before we can even have a robust, meaningful conversation around incentives, we have to have these, you know, defined measurements for success. Uh, and for some organizations, that's as simple as creating their first job description for certain roles within the organization. Um, and I say that because we want to make sure the conversation is meaningful today for, for working at organizations of all sizes. Uh, a lot of larger organizations, national organizations, organizations that have been around for a while have some of these systems and policies in place. Uh, but again, when we talk about measurements, it could be something as simple as just making sure you have job description for you know, the fundraiser within your organization, then, you know, part of that, then in addition to that, you know, what are the goals? What are the fundraising goals? And there may be different measurements. Uh, there may be engagement measurements and then revenue measurements. And, uh, and I did say revenue and revenue measurements, you know, in terms of the amount of money brought into the organization. So again, before we can even talk about the icing on the cake, what are the other things that, that need to be there uh, in terms of kind of standards of practice uh, that, that support 
recognizing and valuing the work that folks are doing and helping folks understand where they're meeting the mark and where there might be areas for improvement and how we work together to get there. You know, I, I would have never thought that this is how you would have launched into this conversation because it seems to me that this is so far off the radar for what normally is going on. And maybe this is the root of why we are losing our, our fundraising professionals so rapidly, because I can never remember sitting on a board ever, ever, ever for more than 30 years and hearing anything about other than did we meet the revenue goal or did we not? Mm -hmm. And that's it. And so, you know, tragically, tragically it's like you win or you lose right and then you're out of there type of a thing and that mentality i think is so pervasive that i can see why why fundraisers are like basically screw it i can't make this group happy or or you know as we know tony and you've you've done such a good job of even educating me about this that what you do today is part of a relationship and it goes on. And I've got to believe that those things, you know, come through. But when you're being measured at one point in time on just one small aspect, it's going to be a hard thing to achieve. Right. Or it's going to be a hard thing to win, if that makes sense. Yeah, I totally get where you're, where you're going with that. And it can be a, a hard thing to win. I think it's it's why it's important. And, and we've said this many times. Uh, I'm not the only one that's ever said it. But, you know, fundraising takes takes a village. It takes a lot of folks. Uh, as the fundraising professional, we are the face and the voice of the organization. Uh, we are the, the moment of truth when it comes to trust and transparency uh, for the organization. So there's a, there's a lot <laughs> going on uh, in the work of fundraising professionals beyond, uh, you know, the money that's coming in, or I should say, uh, a lot going on in terms of what it takes to raise the money and to meet the goals. Uh, so it, it's, it's very stressful. Uh, but but definitely having defined goals and an understanding of the role helps folks when they get up every day um, have a better understanding of what they're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. I love that you you started off with this. And, and then I want to pull you in on another topic that you mentioned in the green room. And I, again, I'm going to sound like a real dope this episode because I, I had never thought of this. But you brought up this really interesting concept about the joy of work and what you're doing and pride and the sense of how you fit into an organization and how that actually ultimately becomes part of this conversation. And so it's an interesting aspect because it's something that um, is an incentive for retention, I think, but something that we don't often talk about it. So I would love for you to kind of visit with us on on this topic a little bit yeah sure no thanks for bringing that up julia yeah in, in the green room we were just talking about the different ways that folks feel and I, here i go incentivize I, <laughs> just yes. like, right? say it fast five times or i screwed it up <laughs> but uh but yeah you know just just kind of what makes you want to get up in the morning and sign in or go to the office and do this work uh, and so we're going to talk about it a little deeper, I think, throughout the conversation in today's show. But one of those things is joy. It's not always about money. It's not always about time off. Uh, it's not always about getting the shiny thing at the five year mark of your tenure, uh, the pan clock or the what, I mean, whatever that is. Yeah. Uh, but creating this environment of joy and this workplace of joy, I think, is one of the first um, opportunities, if you will, to um, create an incentive for folks to want to get up and log in and do the work and support the mission and and tackle uh, the the situations that their organizations are there to tackle and and overcome. So uh, so yeah, just so creating this this place of joy and there are many different ways to do that. It doesn't cost a lot of money, uh, but convening your teams. 
you know, periodically, at least once a month, uh, just to create that opportunity for them to get to know each other and to really kind of build this stronger camaraderie uh, amongst the team. So I think creating this workplace and, and just a place of joy uh, is a huge incentive for folks. Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting thing because I would have never put that in this conversation. I wouldn't have framed this up. And yet, um, you know, shamefully so, we need to be talking about this because in the nonprofit sector, it's not all wine and roses. We do really hard work. And then if you don't, if it's like a slog and you're just like, oh, it, 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 it shows in the way you, you work with your team, your donors, your community. If it's such a negative thing, then, you know, you're, you're out the door, right? Well, you even said in the green room, it said, you know, Part of the challenge when we talk about creating joy in, in the workplace and the ways that I'm, I'm mentioning this is the measurement. Like, how do you really measure that? Yeah, uh, what right. is the what is the KPI or OKR for joy? Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, part of what we talked about was, at least for me and in, in my experience, and, and that's where everything I say kind of comes from is based on, you know, my lived experience and, and things I read and learn from others. But um, you can measure it pretty easily just by paying attention to how folks are speaking, their tone, their body language, uh, whether that be in real life or, or via Zoom. So there are many ways just by observation uh, that you can tell whether or not uh, you're creating a workplace of, of joy and if you're creating an incentive for folks to show up every day. Yeah, it, really interesting. And I, I think it's a it's such a healthy way to be looking at the entire culture of an organization. I mean, that yeah. should be kind of one of those, those, those pieces. Another thing that you talk about interest, interestingly enough is the importance of annual performance reviews. Mm -hmm. um, what's been your experience and, and what have you been seeing along these lines? Yeah, I, I mentioned this because again, I feel like before we can talk about incentives, there needs to be kind of these measurements and processes and, and policies in place that let us all know how we're doing, how we're performing, are we meeting expectations, are we exceeding expectations? Uh, and so, yeah, I think the importance of an annual performance review, uh, it sits there before we can talk about, you know, can, before we can talk about incentives. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, I think most larger organizations already have this down. Um, from my experience and going back to my early corporate days with American Express, uh, when I think about kind of performance reviews and what that process looks like, you know, it's typically a two-way street. So the, uh, the supervisor or um, board chair, again, who, whomever um, is being reviewed, whoever they're reporting to, they're going to do a review and then there's going to be a self-appraisal done as well. Uh, the reviews usually consist of a review of OKRs or KPIs. How are we performing in terms of meeting goals uh, for the organization? And then there's usually a part of that review that talks about uh, core competency. So then we're going to talk about kind of how are we performing in terms of uh, leadership or uh, knowledge of of the work that we're doing or our teamwork. Um, and then there's, you know, they're usually set up in, in some type of, of measurement like rating from one to five. But, uh, but again, I think it's super important that there be in a performance review. Uh, when it happens, it shouldn't be a surprise. <laughs> uh, right. And that, and it's definitely a a conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, again, there there are tons of great resources available online. Folks can reach out to me directly if they like. I have a lot of different kind of templates that I, I'd happily share. Uh, but I think before we can talk about really incentives, these kinds of things you know need to be in place, like an annual performance review. And that doesn't mean that folks are only getting feedback once a year, right? So hopefully, you know, monthly or, or at a minimum quarterly, uh, fundraisers are getting feedback on their performance and are, are having conversations to kind of look at where they are, uh, you know, in terms of, of meeting goals. Right. And I, I appreciate that you said that because it, it seems to me that, you know, the old school mentality, it's like you live or die by this one point in time. 
and then that's it. Right. And then you have to wait like a whole nother 12 months to, to, to be evaluated. And again, if we go back to this premise, Tony, that we're bleeding off talent in these short time frames, we don't have that luxury, right? We've mm -hmm. got to be uh, navigating these conversations and these these practices so that we're we're staying up, we're staying on top of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, it becomes really, really important. Okay, let's talk about the next thing, and that is the merit increase policy. What does that look like? Um, because I'm assuming you're lumping in development staff with everybody else. So talk to me about this. Yeah. So it, it, when we talk about, you know, fundraisers and, and again, a lot of these kind of foundational things that we're talking about today, um, they do go across the entire organization. So yeah. what is the merit increase policy for your organization? What does that look like in writing? Do you have one? Uh, and a lot of times uh, they need to be written with a lot of flexibility because the merit increase a lot of times is going to be based on uh, the success of the organization and how the organization is growing. Uh, but just when I think about my experience, again, there have been many times where uh, that policy may say, you know, based on a performance rating of X, Y, and Z, and uh, based on uh, the financials of the organization at this time, uh, you, you may expect a merit increase of three to six percent. I'm just throwing out percentages, right? Right, right. Uh, right. You know, three to three to six percent. Uh, so that, again, so that folks have something to, you know, to look forward to. Uh, and then, of course, you have to, as leaders of the organization, live up to whatever that policy, you know, look, you know, looks like. Uh, but again, I think that's an that's an incentive for folks to know that uh, the work that they're take that they're doing is taken seriously. Um, that the work that they're doing is being monitored, celebrated. They're being held accountable for results, and then they're also being rewarded for meeting or exceeding those uh, expectations. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this is a great idea. And I do think it is, um, it, it becomes an incentive when you know it's going to be there, right? When you know the discussion is going to be there and there's a policy and there's a system for figuring out what that looks like versus this mm -hmm. kind of nebulous thing, like will, will it happen or won't it happen? Um, which is just uh, gut wrenching if you're trying to figure out, you know, your future and, and certainly the economics of your family. Um, that that's a tough, tough thing. So, well, so and I think, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, Julie, but I I think also uh, why it's important to mention uh, the relevance of this for fundraisers and retention of fundraisers. Uh, it's relevant that we talk about how it's important across the board. Uh, in a previous show, we talked about how sometimes the, the perception, especially for fundraisers, that, oh, they're out at galas and they're having fancy yeah. dinners and, you yeah. know, they're at cocktail receptions. Oh, and they're getting merit increases, you know. But, so, again, just to make sure that there's continuity and equity across the organization, uh, these policies need to be across the board. Yeah, I love that you said that because I think that's a huge, huge problem um, in our sector. And that's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, that's something that we just have to keep, you know, educating our teams and our boards as to what we do in our jobs when we're doing fundraising, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it, it's, there's such a disconnect. There's such a disconnect between what goes on. So then let's talk about these incentives. And this is where we're going to really spend the rest of the show. And non-cash payments, do they work? Should we think of them? Should we be strategizing what that even looks like? I mean, I think that's like the first question. And then let's talk about what some of, of those things might be. Yeah, I definitely think non-cash payments work as an incentive to retain uh, top talent. I think as we continue to have great conversations about 
you know, work life, work life balance, and, you know, men mental health and, and, and all of the things, right? As we look at the, the whole person, uh, you know, what does it take for, for me, you know, all of me <laughs> to feel really good? Uh, and, and so time off is, is a great, um, is a great option, I think. Uh, when we look at, you know, we maternity leave, how can we do better at, at maternity or paternity leave, right? How can we do better at that um, across the sector uh, with, with organizations? Uh, also things like uh, volunteer days. So a lot of organizations have policies in place where uh, employees can take a day off and volunteer for an organization. Uh, and that might sound crazy, like I'm working for a nonprofit. Why would I want to take my day off and go spend the day with another nonprofit? Well, it's because we're so passionate about this work and there's so much you can learn by yes. spending the day and volunteering, uh, you know, your time at, a, at another nonprofit. So I think those types of, of um, incentives work really well. I think um, creating an opportunity for uh, mentorship or being part of professional organizations uh, is also a great incentive uh, that that's kind of a, a non-cash directly to the team member. Uh, yeah. Still an investment, right? If we're talking about memberships or, or um, tuition for any type of professional development, that's still coming out of the budget of the organization, but it's a non-cash payment uh you know to uh to the employee mm -hmm. so uh, so i think there are just to get really creative during the pandemic uh at my my previous place of work we would convene monthly online for for socials uh, we would have someone that would come and come on and do like a professional scavenger hunt uh you know, those again are kind of around those creating joy in the workplace right uh, right but but they were you know they were just Again, things that that put a smile on on the face of our team members, and that they walked away from feeling like the organization cared about them, right. um, and, you know, and how they were how they were feeling. I think that's an interesting thing because we can't forget that sometimes when you do have a an increase in pay, then you have other things that you have to navigate, and that might be um, taxes. That might have to do with you know, your family situation and, and how that changes the dynamic for um, everything from child support to, you know, uh, monthly distribution. So I think that's something to think about. I had a really interesting thing um, happen early in my board service. Uh, we had a board member of an organization I supported that was um, the president of a, a large uh, grocery store chain. And that person uh, came to us with gift cards for the number of employees that we had. And I want to say they were like a hundred dollars. I mean, back in the day, that was, it was a lot, right? And they were a hundred dollar gift cards and we were able to distribute those to all of the employees. And it was like, gold had fallen from the heavens, right? You know, and it wasn't Tony tied to Thanksgiving or Christmas. I mean, this was like in the middle of the spring or summer. You know what I mean? It was just like, we appreciate you. This is a bonus kind of thing. And then from there, the HR department took a lesson in this and they started to find other supporters of the organization to determine what they could do. And ultimately they came up with packages for, um, uh, Diamondback baseball tickets, which is the MLB team here in our community, which that that uh, MLB team it was supporting the organization, right? And so to come up with tickets was was a natural nexus between the two organizations, and they just really did a great job of coming up with these other things. That now that I think back about it, you know, they weren't cash payments; they had they certainly had value but mm -hmm. they added to the culture they added mm -hmm. to the joy that that you brought up first off with today's show and um 
I used to just say, wow, that's really neat. But now I see that it was like more than just neat and nice. It really had a place and a function um, that was probably a win-win, right? I mean, if you had a business and you're like, yeah, I want to support the business. I can't write a check necessarily, but I can do gift cards or gift certificates or I can have a discount, um, you know, that is extended to these employees, things of that nature. It's very yeah, hard. Well, yeah, I'm glad that you put those were super examples. I'm really glad that that you you brought those up and and kudos to the HR department for kind of recognizing the value of that and then kind of picking up, up picking it up and saying what more can we do along these lines and 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 the same thing here you know there there are times where organizations might get tickets donated from the you know the local major league baseball team and and so there's a night out at the ballpark or something uh, again it's it's just uh, creating these opportunities to elevate the joy that folks feel uh, when it comes to being part of the organization. And also, I, I talk about you know this all the time in these opportunities, the team building that takes place and, and the deepened camaraderie that takes place among the teams when they're in these kind of environments where they can, um, you know, just have conversations about whatever it is they want to talk about uh, that isn't so uh, connected always uh, to the mission and vision of, of the organization. Yeah, I love that. Well, you know, I think especially as we've been talking today, um, we've got to be thinking about how do we retain these fundraisers because they are on the front lines building these relationships. We're just seeing them evaporate. We're just seeing them let go. And um, we've got to do a better job uh, for, for our sector as a whole of understanding what we can do to build more, you know, more support at home, if you will, right? That these folks yeah. stay on with us. Um, yeah, I, I, I think one of, one of the challenges and opportunities when we talk, because again, one size does not fit all. Uh, and, and even in this conversation, like what what motivates me and what I find to be an incentive may be very different from you or many of, of the folks, you know, listening or, or watching today's show. So how do we create an opportunity to personalize those incentives while still allowing for equity and access across the board for all of our team members. So uh, I think that that's where the real challenge and opportunity rests is how do we approach this uh, without, you know, without using kind of a cookie cutter solution, uh, but by also making sure that uh, whatever is being offered to you or to me, that there's equity and access across the board for others to engage in the same way yeah i love that you I, I love that you're kind of wrapping that up uh with us today because i think that's really true and again you you brought it up and we we talk about this a lot but you know other folks that within our organizations that think that development staff just goes out and drinks and parties and goes to lunch that does not help this conversation if we're not looking at uh, some sort of incentive going across um, the entire organization. So I really appreciate that. Um, you know, this is going to be an evolving conversation, Tony, because we are in the thick of things changing in the nonprofit sector and how we fundraise and all of these aspects of uh, the job is not the same, right? The donors are not the same. The behavior of donors, it's not the same. So we need to be thinking about this strategically um, so that we can grow our organizations. Um, mm -hmm. As always, you are amazing. I love my time with you. You always give me something to think about. And so thank you for joining us uh, on Fundraisers Friday. Always a pleasure to be here, Julia. Thank you so much. Hey, you know, another great pleasure that we have is our acknowledging our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out, and they really make a difference in the lives of so many communities. Hey, Tony, it's Friday. 
it's been a really busy week. Next week, it's going to be super busy. And so we're going to end with this mantra and this message to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everybody.